Um, the paper I'm going to read you is one I wrote a few years ago. Uh, it's, uh, it doesn't bear specifically on LDS theology. Most of the examples actually are drawn from Catholicism, and I haven't tried to rewrite it for this audience, but perhaps you can make the sort of necessary corrections on your own. Science and religion are often said to be irreconcilable. The principal argument for this claim is that it's intellectually irresponsible both to believe in the existence of a benevolent and omnipotent creator and to accept the results of modern science. I'm dubious about this notion of intellectual responsibility. I think that William James and John Dewey, the great American pragmatists, showed us why that notion is less useful than it may seem. So today I'm going to be trying to restate some of James's and Dewey's arguments. To make the issue I want to discuss a bit more concrete, I'll ask you to consider an evolutionary biologist who is also a religious believer. Call this imaginary person Professor Ryan. Ryan spends her working hours trying to figure out how to bridge the gaps in Darwin's story of how the mammals, and in particular the human beings, came into existence. Her work is done against the background of, and takes for granted, the usual story about the history of the physical universe, the story first told by Lucretius and enlarged upon by Galileo, Newton, and Einstein. This story is about elementary particles batting about without purpose and coming together to form stars, planets, protein molecules, and eventually everything else. God doesn't get into the act. On Sundays, Ryan goes off to Mass, recites the Lord's Prayer and the Creed, takes communion, and all the rest of it. She doesn't think much about the relation between her weekday and her Sunday activities. She was raised a Catholic, has never seriously considered abandoning Catholicism, and relishes the experience of communal worship. Ever since she realized that her oldest son was gay, she's had doubts about the Church's views on various issues, and she regards the present Pope as much too preoccupied with sex, but she figures that Popes come and go, and the next one may be a bit better. Although she's married to an agnostic, her husband agreed that their children would be raised as Catholics. Her oldest son has stopped going to Mass and has, in a casual and offhand way, gone over to his father's agnosticism. This pains Professor Ryan somewhat, but not enough to cause a family crisis. She still hopes that her other children will stick by the faith of her ancestors. When her kids were studying the Catechism, they would ask her the usual questions about just how God managed to create the world out of nothing, how Jesus managed to be both fully God and fully man, and how the consecrated host on the altar manages to be the divine substance while retaining its previous appearance. She shrugged the questions off. She has little interest in theology and is quite content to toss in the phrase, mystery of faith, where it will do the most good. <laughs> Many people like my fictional Professor Ryan actually exist. Lots of people who see themselves as perfectly good, perfectly sincere believers in some standard version of Christianity or Judaism or Islam, nevertheless unquestioningly adopt propositions such as those of the Darwinian theory of biological evolution, which other believers think incompatible with the creeds of their respective faiths. These people, like Professor Ryan, are the despair both of their swaggeringly atheistical scientific colleagues and of the less liberal members of the clergy. Professor Ryan, for example, is well aware and rather amused by the fact that her parish priest would like her to take the Pope's pronouncements more seriously than she does. She's also well aware that her atheistical colleagues make jokes about her religion behind her back. She is equally insouciant about both. The question I want to discuss is, is Ryan behaving in an intellectually irresponsible way? 
If so, it's presumably because she makes no attempt to weave the beliefs relevant to her professional activities together with those which dictate her Sunday church going. Should she make such an attempt, and if so, why? It's not enough to answer this question by saying that it is a law of logic that we should not hold contradictory beliefs and that we all have a moral obligation to think logically. For it is always possible, as St. Thomas Aquinas remarked, to dissolve a contradiction by making a distinction. It may seem, for example, that I should not accept both the, Carti the Copernican account of the heavenly bodies and still believe that the sun is moving steadily closer to the horizon. But, of course, I can resolve that contradiction by distinguishing between the astrophysical and the common sense descriptions of solar motion. It may seem that I should not both believe that there is wet bread on my tongue and that I am partaking of the very substance of my God, but I can resolve the contradiction by distinguishing between the theological and the common sense descriptions of what's going on. We make this sort of contradiction resolving distinction all the time. For example, when the courts decide hard cases, they make distinctions nobody has ever drawn before in the hope of avoiding the charge that they are treating like cases in unlike ways. It's never easy to say when such distinction making is legitimate and when not. The same judicial opinion is often described with equal conviction and honesty as brilliant analysis and as disingenuous rationalization. When it comes to the purported clash between religion and science, however, it may seem difficult to wiggle one's way out of the appearance of contradiction. For surely the universe was either planned out by an intelligent being, one who is concerned with our welfare and our actions, or it's a fortuitous assemblage of contingencies. It seems too simple to say that it can be described one way on Sundays for religious purposes and the other way on weekdays for all other purposes. The difference between the two ways of describing the universe seems too important to be shrugged off by just making a distinction between different purposes. Furthermore, the difference between these two descriptions doesn't seem analogous to the difference between the common sense and the scientific descriptions of solar motion. For in the latter case, we can escape contradiction by saying that it's handy and harmless to have two different vocabularies, one for everyday purposes and another for scientific purposes. The relation between statements made in these two vocabularies is not exactly contradictory, but simply a matter of speaking crudely and speaking precisely. The crude way of speaking, which tells us that the sun moves across the sky, can be replaced with a more precise description of what is going on, a description which saves and explains the appearances when we need to do so. But the scientist, who is also a religious believer, can hardly say that either biology or the catechism is a crude, oversimplified, but convenient way of speaking. For the scientific and the religious vocabulary are equally refined and precise. Both purport to describe how we got here where human beings come from. One of them surely must be wrong. Anybody like Professor Ryan, many people would say, must be schizophrenic or at least intellectually irresponsible. One familiar way to defend people like Professor Ryan against the charge of intellectual irresponsibility has been to distinguish between literal and symbolic truth. Paul Tillich, the great liberal Protestant theologian, said that the statements of science are literally true, whereas those of religious faith are, as he put it, symbolic expressions of our ultimate concern, where an ultimate concern is that which is, was defined by Tillich as what we love with all our hearts and souls and minds. Tillich said that all of us had symbols of ultimate concern, only some of which are personalized deities, the revolutionary power of the proletariat is such a symbol for Marxists, the incarnation is such a symbol for Christians. Just as Marxists allow no empirical facts to spoil their image of the proletariat, 
and just as positivists allow none to interfere with their images of physics and mathematics, so Christians allow no empirical fact to tarnish their sure and certain hope of resurrection. Tillich's point was that a debate between Marxists and Christians, or a debate between Marxists and positivists, is not like a debate between an advocate of Ptolemy's and an advocate of Copernicus's theories about heaven, the motion of heavenly bodies, or like a debate between Darwinians and creationists. In the latter cases, there is plenty of agreement about what phenomena need to be explained and room for debate about which explanation of these phenomena meets certain familiar agreed-upon criteria. But in the case of the Marxists versus the Christians or the Buddhists versus the Hindus, it seems silly to try to get agreement on what phenomena need explanation or about criteria for satisfactory explanation. Well, the whole idea of explaining phenomena, in fact, seems irrelevant to these disagreements. So, liberal theologians like Tillich say, let us think of religion and science as sorry, let us think of religion and philosophy as dealing in symbols and science as dealing in facts. The same facts are compatible with the invocation of many different sets of symbols. The typical response to Tillich's distinction between symbol and fact, a response made both by religious fundamentalists and by militant atheists, is to say that what Tillich called symbolic expressions are just factual claims for which there are no good arguments. There's a, a line in Mark Twain, uh, I think it is, where a school child is asked to define the word faith, and he says, faith is when you believe something you know isn't so. <laughs> Fundamentalists think that Tillich is an atheist who didn't have the courage of his convictions. Atheists think that he is a mere obscurantist, and both think that he is intellectually dishonest. I don't think that Tillich was intellectually dishonest, but I also, I also don't think that his notion of symbolic truth is very helpful. The cash value of his term symbolic seems to me seems to be merely irrelevant to prediction and control. Tillich's interpretation of theology as symbolic expression of Christian concern merely reiterates the claim that theology should not try to compete with natural science in explaining how things come to pass, how the human species got here, for example. Nor is it supposed to, predict with, to compete with science in predicting what's going to happen. That's why theology remains immune to empirical disconfirmation and why acquiring or losing belief in God is more like falling into or out of love than like winning or losing an argument. It seems to me more helpful to forget the literal symbolic distinction and simply to say that since the development of modern science, religious beliefs and scientific beliefs have become tools for doing different jobs. Scientific beliefs help us predict and control events in space and time. This job used to be done by cosmogonic hypotheses pervaded by priests and prophets, but it can now be done better. Religious beliefs give us a way of thinking of our lives which puts them, puts them in an emotionally satisfying context. Religion oversteps its bounds when it picks a quarrel with science, as when the Christian clergy picked quarrels with Galileo and with Darwin. Science oversteps its bounds when it tells us that we have no right to believe in God now that we have better explanations of the phenomena which God was previously invoked to explain. This way of reconciling science and religion requires one to abandon the idea that there is one way the world really is and that science and religion compete in telling us what that one way is. Abandoning that idea is easiest if one thinks of beliefs as tools for accomplishing purposes rather than as attempts to represent the intrinsic nature of reality the way things are in themselves. Instead of insisting that there is such a way, the way the world really is, 
one will hold that although there are alternative descriptions of what's going on, descriptions which are useful for different purposes, none of these descriptions are closer to the way things really are than any of the others. The sole virtue of any descriptive vocabulary is its utility. It can't claim a further virtue called accurately representing the way the world is in itself. This view of the function of descriptions is at the heart of the pragmatism developed by James and Dewey. This technique of reconciliation also requires one to say that there is no such thing as the search for truth if that search is conceived of as something categorically distinct from the search for happiness. For all we know about truth on a pragmatist view is that we call beliefs true when we conclude that no competing belief serves the same purpose equally well. We want prediction and control, and scientific beliefs give us that. We also want to love something with all our heart and soul and mind, and philosophical and religious beliefs may help us do so. Different human needs give rise to different ways of describing ourselves in the world, and thus different candidates for belief. These candidates may, however, be, as it were, running for different offices, and so need not get in each other's way. These ways of thinking about truth, belief, and reality add up to the view of knowledge common to the American pragmatists, to Friedrich Nietzsche, and to such post-Nietzschean European philosophers as Heidegger and Derrida. All these thinkers give up on the idea of reality as it is in itself, and therefore on the idea that the search for truth is an attempt to represent the intrinsic nature of things. They all deny that things have intrinsic natures as opposed to more or less useful descriptions. The view these thinkers share is sometimes described as social constructionism, but that's misleading. These philosophers are not saying that what we used to think was discovered is actually something we invented. Rather, they're just reiterating that we can make no sense of the suggestion that one description of things is closer to the way things really are in themselves apart from human needs and interests. The best we can do is to discover that one description is more useful than another for the satisfaction of one or another human need. These philosophers all deny that truth is a matter of correspondence to the way things are independent of such needs, for, they argue, there is no way we could ever test for such correspondence. Any test would have to compare a vocabulary a way of talking about them with a way of with them things as they are apart from any way of talking about them. And there is no way we know how to do that. Things come to us under descriptions. You don't catch them naked and then become able to compare the naked reality with the description. There are many objections to this pragmatist view and many defenses against these objections. But today I want to stick to what James and Dewey said about religion, and in particular to discuss the way in which James replied to the claim that religious faith is indeed intellectually irresponsible. In an essay called The Will to Believe, James responded to a contemporary philosopher, W.K. Clifford's version of this claim, Clifford was a 19th century positivist who famously wrote, I quote, If a belief has been accepted on insufficient evidence, the pleasure is a stolen one. It is sinful, because it is stolen in defiance of our duty to mankind. It is wrong always, everywhere, and for anyone to believe anything upon insufficient evidence. End of quote from Clifford. Clifford asks us to be responsive to what he calls evidence as well as to human needs. So the question between James and Clifford comes down to, is evidence something which floats free of human projects, or is the demand for evidence simply a demand for the satisfaction of one particular human need, 
the need for agreement and belief when engaged in cooperative social projects. James thought that it was the latter. <coughs> On James's view, it's reasonable to demand, to demand evidence from those with whom we are engaged in a common enterprise. For example, when we are scientists concerned to develop the best tools for accurate prediction, or when we are judges trying to make our country's laws coherent, but when we're engaged in private idiosyncratic projects, such as the ser search for meaning which leads us to religion, literature, and philosophy, it is not so clear that we have an obligation to produce evidence. James summed up his reply to Clifford as follows. I quote James. Our passional nature not only lawfully may, but must decide an option between propositions whenever it is a genuine option that cannot by its nature be decided on intellectual grounds. End of quote. There are, James said, certain live, momentous, and forced options which human beings face and which cannot be decided by anything that Clifford would be willing to call evidence. An option is live if we can't help thinking about it, if we can't help finding it important. It's momentous if, unlike, say, the live option of going to the movies or staying home and cleaning the house, decision between the alternatives is going to have far-reaching effects. It's forced if there's no way of fudging the issue. It can't be decided on intellectual grounds if there's no consensus in the relevant community about what criteria should be used to arrive at a decision. What counts as a live, momentous, and forced option varies from culture to culture and from individual to individual. Some people were, who were raised agnostic never think about religion at all, and for them, the option of becoming a religious believer is not live. Yet, it may become live if, for example, they fall in love with someone who refuses to marry an unbeliever. There are no options which all human beings, simply as human, have a moral duty to confront because options vary with physical and intellectual location. Clifford, on the other hand, sees all human beings as confronted with one universal, unvarying option, the option between facing up to the truth and blinding oneself to it. Our intellectual obligation to withhold belief in the absence of evidence is, for Clifford, linked to our moral obligation to acknowledge truth once evidence is present, an obligation which binds all of us alive. What distinguishes, what distinguishes us from the animals for Clifford is precisely that obligation. The animals merely want to be happy, but we human beings, the rational animals, also, on his view, want to know the truth. To believe in the absence of evidence or to falter in the quest for truth by faltering in the pursuit of further evidence is to betray, for Clifford, one's essential humanity. For pragmatists like James, on the other hand, the search for truth is, this, is the search for beliefs that work, for beliefs that get us what we want and thereby contribute to our happiness. So there's no big discontinuity between us and the animals. We just have bigger brains and better equipment than they do, and so can enjoy more complex and interesting kinds of happiness than they can. One of these kinds of happiness consists in the sheer pleasure of finding beautiful, comprehensive, predictive scientific theories. Another is the better control over ourselves and our environment, which such theories make possible, the sort of thing we get from the invention of anesthetics and airplanes. Still another is the kind of happiness which their faith brings to the religious believers and which their lack of faith brings to exuberantly militant atheists. There is no obligation on all human beings to enjoy any of these forms of happiness. The whole notion of obligation is simply out of place in this area. When Professor Royan looks for the best explanation of a puzzling biological fact, she is, of course, bound to look for an explanation which will be supported by evidence available to her fellow scientists. 
in her professional work, there are agreed upon criteria for satisfactory explanations and for what counts as confirming and as disconfirming evidence. But on James's view, this is not because she is seeking truth as opposed to seeking happiness. Rather, she is seeking for tools which will do a certain job that certain human beings have undertaken, namely putting together a comprehensive account of what spatiotemporal events are causally linked to what other spatiotemporal event to, to what other spatiotemporal events, and in particular of how biological evolution works. When Ryan expresses her contempt for Catholic fundamentalists who reject Darwin, She's expressing contempt for people who try to use old bad tools when new and better tools are available. When Ryan attends Mass, takes communion, and recites the Creed, however, she is not taking part in a cooperative quest for the best solution to a practical problem. She is no more answerable to demands for evidence than she was when she decided whom she was going to marry or when she decided what profession she was going to follow. She is seeking happiness in these situations in her own way, on her own time, and for her own sake. So much for an outline of James's reply to Clifford. I think this reply is the right one to make to anyone who says that religious faith is intellectually irresponsible. It amounts to saying that we have no responsibilities to something called the truth, but only responsibilities to other human beings. The question of whether there is evidence for a belief is the question of whether there exists a certain human community which takes certain relatively non-controversial propositions as providing good reasons for that belief. Where there is such a community, a community to which we want to belong or to continue to belong, we have an obligation to our fellow members not to believe a proposition unless we can give some good reasons for doing so, reasons of the sort that the relevant community takes to be good ones. Where there is no such community, we do not. Nobody knows what would count as non-question-begging evidence for the claims of the Catholic or the Mormon Church to be the one true Church, but that does not and should not matter to the Catholic or the Mormon communities. Biologists, on the other hand, know quite well what counts as evidence for Darwinism or against creationism. James, unfortunately, thought of the opposition between responsibilities to our fellow humans and to ourselves in terms of a distinction between, as in the, in the passage I quoted, intellectual grounds and pa our passionate nature. I think that was a mistake. That suggests a picture of human beings as having two distinct faculties with two distinct purposes, one for knowing and the other for feeling. This picture has to be abandoned once one gives up, as I think we should, the idea that there is a purpose called knowing, knowing the truth, interpreted as the process of getting in touch with the intrinsic nature of reality. It would be better to erase the sort of faculty psychology that draws, draws a nice clean line between reason and emotion and substitute a picture of human minds as webs of beliefs, of beliefs and desires so interwoven with each other that it's not easy and not necessary to tell when a choice has been made on intellectual grounds or on emotional grounds. Nor is it useful to divide areas of culture or of life into those in which there is objective knowledge and those in which there are only subjective opinions. These traditional distinctions are just misleading ways of making the real distinction between areas in which we have obligations to justify our beliefs to other human beings and areas in which we have no such obligations. James's intellect-passion distinction should be replaced by a distinction between what needs justification and what doesn't. A business proposal, for example, does need justification, but a marriage proposal doesn't. This, make, this replacement makes possible an ethics of belief less rigorous than Clifford's, 
It makes possible a utilitarian ethics that says, with John Stuart Mill, that our right to happiness is limited only by others' rights not to have their own pursuits of happiness unnecessarily interfered with. This right to happiness includes what James called the right to believe. More generally, it includes the rights to faith, hope, and love. These three states of mind can often not be justified and typically should not have to be justified to our peers. Our only intellectual responsibilities are responsibilities to cooperate with others on projects designed to promote the general welfare and not to interfere with their private projects. For the latter, projects such as getting married or getting religion, the question of intellectual responsibility doesn't arise. James's critics will hear what I've just been saying as an admission that religion is not a cognitive matter and that what he called the right to believe is a misnomer for the right to yearn or the right to hope or the right to take comfort in the thought that so-and-so. But James is not and should not be making such an admission. Rather, he's insisting that the impulse to draw a sharp line between the cognitive and the non-cognitive and between beliefs and desires is a residue of the belief that we engage in two distinct quests, one for truth and the other for happiness. James would insist that <clears throat> there is nothing to the idea that religion is non-cognitive except the familiar point that it doesn't do what natural science does. It doesn't predict, doesn't demand confirming instances of universally quantified statements, doesn't hook up neatly with the rest of natural science, and so on. Cuffert, as I've said, thinks that we human beings have an obligation to something big and non-human called the truth, with a capital T, James thinks we have no obligations, as I've said, except to each other. For James, and for pragmatists generally, figuring out what to believe is a subspecies of figuring out what to do, so intellectual responsibility is just a species of moral responsibility. But, as James insisted, beliefs are habits of action rather than attempts to represent how things really are. Some things we do are our own business, Others are other people's business as well. The ethics of belief I've been outlining is, as I've already said, James's extension of John Stuart Mill's utilitarianism. A utilitarian moralist will say, for example, that there cannot be anything wrong with any sexual act performed by consenting adults, since such acts are nobody's business save theirs. Analogously, a utilitarian ethic of belief says that the only point at which we have a right to criticize somebody's religious beliefs is when that belief is made an excuse for interfering unnecessarily with other human projects, as when the clergy try to get in Galileo's or Darwin's way, or when religious people try to pass laws forbidding this or that sexual activity. The only point at which we can criticize somebody's, atheist's beliefs, somebody's atheistical beliefs is when the atheists turn political, as, for example, when Bavarian atheists insisted that Bavarian public schools had to take the crucifixes off the walls of the classrooms. The fact that Professor Ryan's atheist fellow scientist cannot imagine how she reconciles her weekday and Sunday activities should not perturb her any more than the fact that her parish priest can't either. She's doing neither her scientific discipline nor her church any harm, and neither has the right to complain. James dedicated his book, Pragmatism, to John Stuart Mill, and one of the first books ever written on the pragmatist movement in philosophy referred to it as Romantic Utilitarianism. But this characterization of pragmatism raises an interesting question. Mill's utilitarianism was often said by its 19th century opponents to be a godless, materialistic creed. Those who take that view of utilitarianism and of pragmatism will say that the religious should beware of pragmatists bearing gifts. In particular, they should beware of James's suggestion that anybody has a right to believe anything as long as their doing so doesn't compromise any cooperative enterprise to which they've committed themselves. 
They claim that utilitarianism is a view, utilitarianism and pragmatism are views, which could only be accepted by somebody who was already pretty much an atheist, or at least by somebody with no religious feelings, somebody whose sense of human possibilities is narrow and blinkered. This claim, however, presupposes that it's essential to religious faith to submit to the authority of something non-human. But there are broader definitions of being religious. For example, it is often said that for followers of Christ, love is the only law. Nothing on this account of Christianity takes precedence over the duty to be of assistance to one's neighbor, to treat his or her needs with loving kindness. Creedal statements and acts of worship are secondary in comparison to this overriding obligation. Theology on this view is not of the essence of Christian belief, for Christian life is one of service to others. Only such service counts as service to God and a fortiori as being religious. But a life which neglects such service, no matter how many sacraments are received or how many professions made, does not. If one interprets Christianity along these lines, then it's possible to view Mill's utilitarianism as a reformulation of the central Christian doctrine. For utilitarianism says that all human beings, and perhaps even all creatures that can suffer pain, are on a moral par, that they all deserve to have their needs satisfied insofar as this can be done without harm to others. As Jim Flight, which any creature, however weak, may make, ought it not for its own soul's sake to be satisfied? If not, prove why not. The only possible kind of proof you could adduce would be the exhibition of another creature whose demand went the other way. End of quote. The moral egalitarianism that runs through Mills and James's work is a moral attitude which I think could only have flourished in a culture which had been told century after century that God's will was that human beings should love one another, that all men are brothers, and that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek. The idea that everybody, black or white, male or female, Christian or heathen, wise or foolish, has rights which deserve respect and consideration is one which, in the West, has traditionally been backed up by an appeal to the agathistic strand in the Christian tradition. If one does see the claim that love is the only law as central to Christianity, then it's plausible to describe the historical development of Christianity in terms of the gradual substitution of love for power as the essential attribute of God. A God of power is an authority to be obeyed. A God of love is a friend. If one thinks of our relation to God as one of all worship and obedience, then one will insist that utilitarianism and pragmatism have their limits, limits set by God's commands. If God has commanded us to worship him under one name rather than another, or commanded us not to suffer a witch to live, or commanded that women be silent in churches, or that a man shall not lie with a man as with a woman, then no pragmatic or utilitarian consideration can have any force to persuade us of a different opinion. Insofar as Christians see their duty of obedience to God as including more than their duty to serve their fellow human beings, they are worshipping a God of power rather than a God of love. From this point of view, Clifford's claim that we have an obligation to truth, that the pursuit of truth is something different from the pursuit of happiness, is a version of the religious idea that we owe obedience to a higher power. Truth, considered in, as correspondence to the intrinsic nature of reality, is the secular equivalent of a god of power. Science, seen as Clifford does rather than as James sees it, is the Enlightenment's version of the worship of a god of power. But James, by insisting that reality has no intrinsic nature to be respected, is following up on the agathistic strain in Christianity. In saying that our duty to truth amounts to the duty to respect the needs of those fellow creatures with whom we are involved in cooperative activities, pragmatists are following out the line of thought in Christianity which says that love is the only law. 
I've given you the sketch of how pragmatism <coughs> might appropriate Christianity for its own purposes in order to reply to the suggestion that pragmatism is inherently atheistic and begs the question against religion. As I see it, the only question pragmatism begs is whether we are in a state of sin, whether we need to rely on something non-human for our salvation. Anyone who thinks the consciousness of sin essential to religious faith <coughs> will indeed have no use for James's and Dewey's way of reconciling science and religion. But for those who are willing to use the term religious faith to cover both a religion of obedience, submission, and a religion of love, that their project of reconciliation may have some attractions. Thank you. Um, if you're anything like me, that was a lot to absorb in a, in a short amount of time. I really, really enjoyed and appreciated that talk. And um, I'd read the first half of it, and I get a copy and read the second half. Um, if anyone is feeling like you've got enough of a handle on any portion of what was said to have a response or a question, Professor Rorty graciously asked me if we would like to have a question and answer session afterwards, and I'm... I'd, I'd be delighted to hear questions and, and responses and points of view that had to do with this. You might want to take a second and think about them. <laughs> it takes a while to absorb. Yeah, um, you can probably call them. Glenn, why don't we start with you? Oh, okay, I'll call on people. Glenn. <laughs> oh, agapistic based on agape. Agape, yeah, so when you use the term agapistic strain of, real, of Christianity, that would be the love oriented thing you referred to faith, hope, and it's love. It's just a way of avoiding constantly repeating the phrase love is the only law of appreciation for that. Great. Terry. Okay. Do, do you want to come up here? Yeah. What, yeah. What, what do you want me to What? Terry. Okay. This question comes out of Einstein's theory of relativity, which is hundred years old now and says that nothing can go faster than the speed of light, not even information. And so it would seem to be very difficult for the religious God of most faiths to be omnipotent, you know, and how can one central person run everything in the universe or, even, or at least even know everything that's going on in the universe simultaneously if information takes billions of years to travel from one end of the universe to the other. <laughs> I think, you know, you don't really need to bring in Einstein. That there, there are puzzles of that sort that go all the way back, you know, old chestnuts like, you know, can God create a stone too big for him to lift? Can God create a triangle that doesn't have interior angles equal to 180 degrees? And so on. Now, many theologians argued that to give the wrong answer to that question meant limiting God's omnipotence. Uh, I don't think, I mean, whatever God's omnipotence comes to, I don't think it's something that can be spelled out in terms of what he can and can't do. Uh, it wasn't intended for that purpose. To define God as omnipotent is, it seems to me, a way of indicating submission rather than a way, rather than an attempt to explain phenomena. By the way, he has made triangles that don't add up to 180. <laughs> well, we have non-Euclidean space. So. He, he made, let's put it this way, he made Lobachevsky and Riemann. What he did about the triangles is not so clear. <laughs> well, I, I'm waiting for David, <laughs> for David Bailey to ask the following question. Um, if, okay, um, let, let me try to ask a kind of a question. Okay, you, you've. You've portrayed religion and science as projects that are 
up to different purposes, um, tasks that are involved in trying to satisfy different kinds of needs. In early Mormonism, the early a part of the enthusiasm of early Mormon leaders was that um, all truth, whether it was from science or wherever, would would be integrated into this evolving gospel that somehow all of this truth would fit together in one grand scheme and that science and religion were actually allies in the same general quest. Um, is it your opinion that, that there are such different questions that these two are addressing that they will never really find a, a unifying, uh, that they will, I don't know, is there is any hope for the project of these things of these realms of inquiry knitting together or is it just silly to even think that they're talking about the same world I, I think we've had a couple hundred years worth of experience of attempts to get them together in a synthesis and none of them have worked very well uh, it was a standard move among 19th century philosophers to give an evolutionary account of mind culture that would bring together all aspects of human life. Uh, it continued from Hegel to Whitehead and beyond. Lots of Mormon theologians have picked up on Whitehead and Hartshorn's right. finite theism and tried to, tried to do it again. I doubt it's going to work just because it's failed so often. I think it ten I think it leads What's that taught me. Yeah. <laughs> I think it leads to the kind of bad book you get when um, scientists like the English the Englishman Pokinghorn um um I'm sorry I'm I'm wrong wrong English scientist I've forgotten the guy's name. There's a, a huge book came out a while back uh in which the guy told you lots more than you wanted to know about quantum physics and explained that a certain very particular quantum phenomenon was evidence for the existence of God. This is not a very good way to go about backing up anybody's religious convictions. I mean, you know, quantum physics changes all the time and the phenomenon may not be here next week. You don't, you don't really want to go searching around the details of science for confirmation for your faith. Right. Okay. Yes. Is it conceptually possible to envision a scientifically moral universe or world? Is it conceptually possible? Okay, moral, is it possible to conceive in scientific terms of a sort of a moral order to the universe, a moral purposefulness to the universe? Or has it got to be an amoral, the world of, the world of physical phenomena necessarily amoral? Yeah, I, I think the best you can do is give a causal explanation in scientific terms of how creatures evolved who developed languages and how the creatures that developed languages then developed social norms which they called you know, the moral law. Uh, that's about as the best you can do, it seems to me. How does James ground our obligations to each other? The one moral he, imperative. He thinks the whole idea of grounding is a mistake that you know, philosophers are continually asked, what is the ground for this? What is the foundation of that? How can you absolutely guarantee that what I've always believed is really what I ought to be believing? And of course they can't. I mean, you know, why are they supposed to have a special pipeline to truth and reality that gives you guarantees you can't think up for yourself? And whatever philosophers are good for, it isn't to ground beliefs. It's to try to explain why some people have some beliefs and other people have other beliefs and how they might possibly get together and find areas of compromise. 
Okay, then it, it seemed to me as I was listening to you that there was this one obligation that, that James yeah. had, which was our obligation to each other. Yeah. And, and that's, that, see, that's why I was saying that that claim would not be taken seriously, perhaps, except in the Christian West. That is, you know, we have had this kind of claim dinned into our ears for 2,000 years. Other people in other parts of the world have had similar claims dinned in, but these are historical phenomena which might not have occurred. <laughs> and the ground of, you know, when we find James's or Mill's utilitarianism or moral egalitarianism sympathetic, I don't think that they can say, and the reason you should find it sympathetic is the following deep philosophical ground. We find it sympathetic because it's the kind of thing we were brought up on. So Kant would have a response, but I'm <laughs> I'm not qualified to present it. But um, I mean, the idea that there is that that it's almost universally believed something like the Golden Rule, something like. Well, yeah, it, it seems to me that seems to. it's true. Everybody believes something like the golden rule. The question is, which people do they want to, are they going to apply the golden rule to? N you know, <laughs> Nietzsche said that in a band of robbers, you get the strictest possible sense of honor and moral decency. But, of course, it doesn't extend outside the mafia. <laughs> Now, uh, it used to be that you had people who uh, had every respect for the needs of other human beings as long as they were white. Uh, it, you know, the question, who counts, is the real moral question, not the golden rule. Any social group will abide by the golden rule, but not all social groups have any interest in people, you know, on the other side of the river or belonging to a different tribe or of a different color or of a different religion. Todd. Um, I remember right, James' father was some form of Swedenborgian. Yeah, a, her a heretical Swedenborgian. Can you tell me a little bit about he didn't have any. Uh, he, he, he wrote a huge book called Varieties of Religious Experience, sort of desperately wishing he'd had a religious experience and, and t t telling you endless stories about all these people who had had interesting religious experiences, but you know, he himself just was sort of wistful about it. Yes, sorry. Do you want to repeat a tiny bit of that? So. Yeah, the, the question was, given Islamic fundamentalism and its attempt to say that all science has to be made Islamic, maybe we should have second thoughts about giving people this kind of permission. It seems to me that um, the Muslim intellectuals who say, unfortunately, we in the Muslim world have not yet had our enlightenment, our right. That is, the Muslim, the Muslim fundamentalists are acting exactly the way the Catholic Church acted in 1600 when they burned Giordano Bruno. Uh, the 18th century in Europe and America uh, produced a division of functions between the churches and the scientists, and that's the division of functions that James tried to strengthen and insist on. I, th I think if you, you know, if you have a debate between either a Catholic or a Muslim fundament fundamentalist, and you know, one of the, one of us heirs of the Enlightenment, you're you know, you just won't find enough common ground. I mean, it would be nice if the philosophy professors could tell you which side was right on some 
the basis of some neutral criteria, but I don't think there are any neutral criteria. I mean, the Enlightenment was something that happened only once in human history, and it happened to happen in Europe and America, and we are, in my view, terribly lucky that it happened in Europe and America, and the Islamic world is much less lucky. Um, let's see, was there somebody? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you can repeat that one too. Yeah, I, yeah, I think the I think the reason uh, the reason I've never been religious is I don't have one. That is, there isn't there isn't anything I love with all my heart and soul and mind. I mean, you know, you know, various members of my family maybe, uh, but you know. They're not exactly suitable objects of worship. Beyond them, I, I don't have anything. Are you a Yeah, reasonably so, as, you know, as much as any heir of the Enlightenment is. <laughs> I get, you know, I, I mean, I guess communicating what I got out of all those years is, you know, what I do by writing books, and I don't feel an obligation to write books. I just like writing books, so you know, it, it doesn't, you know, the question of obligation doesn't come up. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I loved writing books. <laughs> I'd have written a lot more. Larry. What I find striking is that philosophy, you know, very distinguished professors of philosophy whom I've sort of known in the way of business all my life turn out to be religious. They never happen to mention it. And then it, you know, then, you know, you, you, in one case I, I was told, did you know that so-and-so has eight kids? And I said, no, why does he have eight kids? He's Catholic. I had the foggiest idea he was Catholic. You know, I've read everything he wrote, but it just doesn't come up. Uh, so it seems to me that, yeah, I know a lot of very religious people, but they tend not to talk about it very much. Uh, yeah, Richard. You, you've given us a, a way of distinguishing between or getting satisfaction out of a description for science and religion in the Mormon religion, is that we're a proselyting religion. We go out and send thousands of people out to try and convince everybody that our explanation meets the needs, meets the needs, or should meet your needs. How do you apply that same principle to this notion of which church is right, or which religion is right, or which description of God is right, or whatever? Um, I mean, it seems to me that being a being a missionary for one's church is you know sort of like writing books you're communicating what how things look to you uh, and as long as the missionaries do it by persuasion rather than force and as long as you're you know you can tell them to go away if you want them to go away and, and they go away uh, you know uh, what what harm is there <laughs> 
It's a nice way of presenting some new symbols to further your search for happiness. It's a, it's a nice way of presenting more symbols for people's options for their search for happiness. On that view, I assume. All right. Well, I thank you for your participation and especially thank Dr. Rohde for coming and sharing his experience and understanding.